So you may know Howard Rheingold as a colorful and prescient anthropologist who defined concepts like virtual communities and smart mobs before we were all participating in them. You may know him as the former editor of the Whole Earth Review and the founding editor of Hotwired. Or perhaps you were a student of Howard's, either at Berkeley or Stanford or his social media classroom and online learning community, Rheingold U. Or maybe you know him for his painted shoes, Paisley blazer, <laughs> Panama hat, and psychedelic art. In fact, when we were in South by Southwest last month, a street person came up to him and thanked him for keeping Austin weird. <laughs> but I know him as dad. So 10 years ago, my dad wrote Smart Mobs, The Next Social Revolution. And this was years before Twitter and Foursquare, before NFC and Google Wallet. My dad wrote about a future in which people will leave messages in places and mobile phones will become remote controls for the physical world. A decade before the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement, he predicted that the merger of mobile phones, personal computers, and the internet were lowering barriers to collective action and were going to enable economic, social, and political revolutions. Sound familiar? In 1985, he wrote Tools for Thought, The History and Future of Mind-Expanding Technology, in which he envisioned the future of personal computing when hundreds of millions of people around the world would be a part of a networked community and how this will change the way people think, learn, and communicate. He warned that nobody knows whether this will turn out to be the best or the worst thing that the human race has done for itself because the outcome of this empowerment will depend in a large part on how we react to it and what we choose to do with it. And in his new book, Net Smart, How to Thrive Online, Howard warns that the future of digital culture depends on how well we learn to use the media that have infiltrated, amplified, distracted, enriched, and complicated our lives. And he introduces five essential literacies for the 21st century. And you'll be able to buy the book for $10 in the back at the end of this talk, thanks to Book Inc. And if you're not able to buy it today, you can go back to Books Inc. and all you need to do is show your, your Google badge. And I really want this to be a conversation. I'm really excited to be connecting him with you guys who are the makers, who are creating the tools that are changing the way people are going to be thinking and living in the 21st century. So I wanna make sure you guys get a chance to ask your questions. And before I jump in, you probably should know who I am. Um, my name is Mamie. I've been a Googler since May 2006, so coming up on six years. I've worked on uh, grassroots innovation at Google and am now on the developer relations team. So to kick it off, I want to ask the question that's on all of our minds. Is Google making us stupid? Well, you know, I would, I would phrase that question differently. Um, but it's a, it's a really good question to start a conversation. You know, I, I strongly believe that if you believe that or fear that our use of social media are making us shallow, then why not teach more people how to swim and explore the deep end of the pool? Um, the slight difference, which I don't think is semantic, which is I'm really a believer in human agency and that technologies afford but don't compel behavior. Okay, so over the last year, 20 years, you've written tools for thought, virtual communities, virtual realities, smart mobs. Why NetSmart? Well, I've, I've thought about this a lot. Um, I've been forced to think about it since I wrote in 1985 about where were personal computers going and in 2000 and, no, 1993 about people socializing online and 2002 about the combination of the, the mobile phone and the internet and the, and the PC. At each point, the question arose, either from critics or from scholars, or a question that I asked myself, which is, is, is this stuff any good for us? And I've, I've concluded that the, the way you use a search engine, the, the way you stream video from a phone, the way you update your Facebook status matters to you and to me and to everyone because first of all these are the languages that we need to know in order to succeed personally but 
the way we use these media today are going to strongly influence the way they are used and misused for, for decades to come. So at, I think you'll see that there's a theme running through the book, which I'm talking about personal empowerment, but I'm also talking about improving the commons. And I think that that is the way to, to improve the commons. So I know when you wrote Tools for Thought, you were inspired by Dunk Egobart's 1962 Augmenting Human Intellect. And I want to know, how do you respond that today? Are we living in the future that he envisioned? If, who here has read Doug Engelbart's 1962 paper? OK, um, it's worth rereading. I reread it just about every year. But you ought to go look at it. It was written in 1962. And everything that's happening here really flowed from that paper, literally. You know, people talk about the mouse, but it's, it's actually hypertext using uh, <laughs> text processing, what became word processing, mixing video and, and uh, uh, computer images. His laboratory was the first network information center for the ARPANET. So it's really kind of the, the root of the technology we use today. And in that paper, he talks about humans using language, artifacts, methodology, and training. And I've talked to, to Doug over the years about this, and he, he notes the obvious, which is that the artifacts have, have multiplied multi-billion fold. The first uh, electronic digital computer used less RAM than an icon does on a, a, a PC <laughs> today. But the, the methodology and the, and the training, maybe less so the language, have not evolved so much. And I think that, that this is a fundamental issue of literacy that faces us every time we have the technical capabilities to communicate and to encode and decode information in new ways. Great, so you mentioned literacy. And in NetSmart, you define five essential literacies for thriving in the 21st century. Um, attention, crap detection, participation, collaboration, and network smarts. And I definitely want to use this conversation to explore each of those literacies, but first, what, what do you mean by literacy, and what's the difference between a literacy and a skill? Well, I'm, um, I use the metaphor of, of swimming at the beginning. If you're the only person in the world who knows how to swim and you fall into deep water, it will serve you well. Uh, if you're the only person in the world who knows how to ride a bicycle, you can still get from place to place faster. If you're the only person in the world who knows how to read and write, or you're the only person who knows how to make a, a link on a web page, it's not going to serve you that well. It's not going to serve anybody else that well. So all of the literacies I talk about, atten attention, participation, collaboration, crap detection, and, and network know-how, have to do with both the skill of encoding and decoding, I mean, the fundamental alphabetic literacy is the ability to read and write. But beyond that individual skill, the ability to use that skill in concert with others. There's a, there's a social connection to all of the skills that we use not only with digital production media, but with the, the digital networks that, that propagate and communicate information. And, and so why is attention the fundamental literacy for an always on world? You know, I think I have a slide here that's kind of interesting. Let me search through it. Oops, I don't have that slide. I, had, I, I took a uh, screen grab from that uh, mall surveillance camera that I'm sure you've all, all seen this. It's had millions of hits on YouTube of the young woman who uh, fell into the fountain while she was texting. Pew, Pew Internet and uh, American Life uh, studies have surveyed uh, Americans and one in six have admitted running into something while looking at their, their phone. And then of course there's the, the, what happens when you're in a classroom. If you are a professor in a classroom today you face students who are looking at their laptops. If you are a Googler in a meeting uh, these days, you are facing people who are looking at their laptops. So uh, attention is a, a fundamental building block of how we think and communicate in any case. But the media that we carry with us these days really affords distraction. And I really make the distinction. I don't think that online media, social media, compel distraction, but they afford it. And the difference, mm. of course, is what we know and what we intend to do. Mm. 
And now, so in 2010, Eric Schmidt had this crazy statistic that every two days, humans produce as much information as they did between the area, era of cave paintings to 2003. And I know people, including M.G. Siegler, are declaring email bankruptcy. But this isn't the first time that humans have suffered from information overload. So I want to ask, how, how do we learn from history? Well, first, I'd, uh, I'll, I'll quote Clay Shirky, who often says that it, there is no such thing as information ov overload. It's just filter failure. And I, I will have to acknowledge, we all have to acknowledge that, that Eric Schmidt's quote means that the quantitative difference in the leap that we're taking today means a qualitative difference. But when I was looking into this is issue of information overload in the book, I discovered that um, this is really not the first time that, uh, that we've dealt with new communication media exploding dramatically the amount of information that, that's uh, available uh, to people. That little clay tablet there is uh, one of the artifacts that led Denis Schmant Besserat to figure out where writing came from. Writing was originally about accounting, but it was later exapted to use to encode other kinds of knowledge. And I think that that idea of exaptation that humans tend to do, both biologically and intellectually, to, to adapt something that was evolved or invented for one purpose to serve another purpose will serve us well. The idea of information overload goes at, at least back to the fourth century uh, BC with Ecclesiastes, but you also saw in the wake of the Gutenberg Revolution, uh, this quote from Adrienne Baillet, the multitude of books which grows every day in a prodigious fashion will make the following centuries fall into a state as barbarous as that of the centuries that followed the fall of the Roman Empire. And then of course there was Vannevar Bush's 1945 article, As We May Think, in which he noted that the summation of human experience is being expanded at a prodigious rate but the means we use for threading through the consequent maze to the momentarily important item is the same as was used in the days of square rigged ships. And this article, uh, of course, was an inspiration to Doug Engelbart and others. Um, every time a new communication information technology makes a flood of information available, people have responded to that by inventing new ways to cope with it. So. Uh, when scribes hand wrote texts, we got libraries and we got schools and we got scholars. The first schools were really to teach people how to, how to, how to read and write. In the, and of course, the, the priesthood con controlled who had access to that literacy and the, the printing press really broke that open. Too much printed information led to many, many things that we take for, for granted every day, alphabetization, indexes, subject headings, authors, uh, critics, editors, a whole ecosystem of human and technical means for dealing with information um, emerged from that. And this is a picture of Engelbart talking about uh, uh, humans using language artifacts, methodology, and training during the, the mother of all demos. And so you've coined terms like virtual communities and smart mobs, and the word that seems to be defined in NetSmart as infotension. So what do you mean? Well, when I talk about attention, I talk about learning to manage our attention. Maybe we'll get, get back to that a little bit. But yeah. I think in particular for us, for the people in this room, managing the way we pay attention to information is particularly important. And, um, and I've looked at ways in which we can do that. And I think it, it, it comes into really two, two different categories. Um, but it comes down to developing a sense of mindfulness of how we are deploying our attention from, from time to time. And I'm sure that, that um, all of you are to some degree experts in a way that many of my students and others I speak to are not. Mindfulness means being aware of the, the content of your consciousness at the moment. W what are you paying attention to? That sounds a little uh, spiritual. You can look at metacognition. There's a good Wikipedia entry about that. Metacognition expands that a little bit to, to say that not only is this a skill, a learnable skill for, for recognizing where you are deploying your attention, developing an awareness of how you are using your awareness, but it also means knowing what all of the different tools in your 
consciousness toolbox are, focused attention, diffused attention, abstraction, and analysis, picking out the one that's useful for the moment. And I think that a lot of what click trance is uh, about, a lot of what people fear with distra distraction online has to do with a lack of decision making about how you're going to p spend your attention from moment to moment. So attention can be trained? I think so, and I've worked on it with my students, I've worked on it with myself, I've shared some of it with you. I, I divide that into the cognitive part and the, and the part that has to do with uh, how you arrange your information tools, because we, we all need to make decisions on a second by second or microsecond by microsecond basis. What are you going to pay attention to? Mm -hmm. that there's that, I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that it was easy to change our attention from what we think we're supposed to be doing, we would not have the preponderance of QCAT videos. You will click on that link, you will, you will look at that video, you will see the little uh, red badge that tells you you've got more email or that, that tells you there's a, an update in, in, in Facebook or, or G+, and, and you're, you're attracted to it without thinking about it. So the first part of this training is to try to make those decisions more deliberately. And at, at first, that's slow. Sometimes you open a tab, you're going to check it out later. Sometimes you, you tag it, you bookmark it, because you may not check it out later, but when you want to look for it, you will, you'll be able to, to find it uh, more easily. So a, a method of training that part of it has to do with matching the atten your attention to the way your tools look on the screen. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that and, and, and show you that. I, I, de I developed this from what I learned from uh, Professor B.J. Fogg at Stanford, who's got a course on developing new habits. And he says, start small, find a place for it, and repeat. So um, I guess I don't have that other slide there. But what I, I do is write down at the beginning of the day good old um, right-brained handwriting on a piece of uh, three by five card, you know, maybe six or seven words. What are my two or three goals for the day? And sometimes there are no particular goals. I don't have a deadline. Following each link where it leads is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, that's how I discover things. Some days I've got a deadline. I've got to get a certain amount of words written by the end of the day. So I put that piece of paper in the periphery of my attention. And when I'm when my, my eyesight wanders, uh, catches sight of that, and I ask myself, uh, what am I paying attention to right now? And is that going to get me any closer to where I'm going? I actually learned this technique when I was trying to learn how to do lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is when you realize you're in a dream and you begin directing the action. And the way you learn to do lucid dreaming is you write, am I awake, on a little piece of paper. You put it in your pocket, and you take it out once an hour. You just develop a habit. Eventually, you do that in a dream, and, and you do a little reality testing. And <laughs> find out that you, the, the best way to do it is to try to fly. And if you can fly, you're pretty much sure that, that you're, <laughs> you're dreaming. in a dream. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the same thing applies to the metacognition of attention online, in that this, putting this piece of paper on the, on the periphery of my vision is not meant to police me, but to develop a kind of inner observer that becomes aware of how I'm paying my attention, what I'm paying attention to. Hmm. So I know you, you turn to Dana Boyd often, and in this month's issue of Brown Alumni Magazine, she's quoted as saying, the goal is to be peripheral, peripherally aware of information as it flows by, grabbing it at the right moment when it is most relevant and valuable, entertaining or insightful. And that really resonated with me as I read your book. And so how do your literacies enable us to do that? You know, when I, well, I discovered this when I assigned my students to uh, follow Twitter, and to create some RSS feeds. And I came back the next week, and they were all panicked because they couldn't possibly keep up with it. And I realized that I had forgot to, for, forgotten to frame it with what I know and what probably all of you know, which is that this is not a queue. It's a stream. You don't need to check each thing off like a to-do list. You can't. You learn how to sample the stream. You look at and and. A lot of the affordances of RSS enable you to scan headlines or, to, or, or when you search, you get snippets. So there's, there are informational cues there in, in the, the, our dashboards that we need to be able to use more effectively. 
So once we are aware of what information we are paying attention to, we need to validate and verify and, and filter that information. And so tell us, how can we all tune our internal crap detectors? So um, politely, you can call this critical consumption of information. Um, Hemingway used the term crap detector. He said every good journalist needs an, an internal uh, crap detector. So I looked into the research on, uh, on how people search. I'm sorry Dan Russell isn't here. He's one of, one of the sources for the book. And I, I talked to, to Dan Russell, the search scientist here. And I looked at a, a lot of the research, particularly on how young people search. There's a, a, an extraordinarily large number of young people who believe if it's on Google, it must be true. And of course, when, when Mamie first started using search engines, Google didn't exist. It was Alta Vista and InfoSeek. Um, I used uh, MartinLutherKing.org. Uh, everybody here aware? Anybody here aware of MartinLutherKing.org? Have you ever heard of it uh, before? It's a it's a good site to to train people. Um, so it's what one two third. It's the fourth hit down on Google the last time I checked. It's called Martin Luther King Jr. A True Historical Examination, and it looks like a, a website about the civil rights leader. Um, if you look at the articles, though, it takes, it takes a really pretty radically dim view of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And there is an author here. So when Mamie said, well, how do I know what's true and what's not? I said, well, you know, this is, you, you happen to come along at a very unusual time. For the last thousand years, the authority was vested in the text. You can take a book out of the library and you might disagree with it, and it might even be wrong, but for the most part, you can bet that there was an author, an editor, and a publisher who tried to check some of the facts in it, or, or the, the truth claims in it. Of course, you put a term into a search engine, there's no guarantee that what you get back is going to be good information. So one thing to do is look for an author and search on that author's name, which we were able to do here, but we couldn't find a, an author for the site itself so I, I t told Amy about who is, tell my students about who is. And of course, if you put uh, martinlutherking.org uh, into who is, it, it shows you that someone by the name of Don Black at stormfront.org, which turns out to be a neo-Nazi community. That's, this is what's known as a, a cloaked site. So I've developed a whole uh, collection of sites that I've uh, shown to students to show them that not everything you see online is for real. That, the free online pregnancy test was a lot scarier at first. They didn't really clue you in to it being a joke. Um, now, they, now they do, but uh, if, you, if you enter a name and click on start pregnancy test, a little flash animation comes up and says, sit still while we, we scan you. And uh, I entered the name Joe. Turns out that, that Joe is with child. Um, I couldn't help but click on the next one and find out that it's a girl. Of course. And then I asked who the da <laughs> who's the daddy, and if you don't like that, you can choose another one. But you know, by this point, you probably have figured out that it's a, a, a hoax. But there are lots of sites like this one looks perfectly legitimate, nicely designed website. This is about a, a primate, a mandrel that's been trained to understand English and to respond with a keyboard. Totally non-existent. This a lot of teachers use this one. There's the endangered Pacific uh, Northwest tree octopus, a completely non-existent species. So I've, in the book, I go into a lot of detail about this, particularly when you're talking about medical information, Googling your symptoms. Um, there, there are tools that we can use to find out whether the, the advice we're going to get is going to kill us or, or help cure us. But I think you have to start by thinking like a journalist or thinking like a detective and not assuming anything and looking for clues. Um, I think searching to learn is, is very important. If you're not just looking for where's the the nearest pizza joint, and you're trying to learn about something, don't just stop at the first page of results. Look at the snippets that you get and refine your search from what you see in the snippets. They often teach you about that. Look for authors and search on their names and, and triangulate what any good journalist does. I remember being online when a rumor came across on Twitter that Egypt had, had shut down internet access, which comes under the category of interesting if true. But there was nothing on Al Jazeera, there was nothing on CNN, there was nothing on BBC, so I put out an inquiry on Twitter about anybody who could give me information that would help me verify that. One person 
uh, reminded me that someone I do know uh, is in touch with people in the Middle East and was talking on the phone to uh, someone in Egypt and I direct messaged them and got, he, he verified it. Someone reminded me of Ping. I tried some, some websites in Egypt and they were down. Finally, I saw a, a news report online. So with three, I, I was confident that I could pass this information along without it, it being a false rumor. Not long before or after that uh, was the Haitian earthquake and there was a rumor that also went around on Twitter that if you texted a certain phone number, it would send money to send medical personnel to Haiti. And that turned out to be a cruel hoax. So I think it's important for people to triangulate to crap detect themselves before they pass information along. And I think also, you probably heard Eli Paris spoke here, speak here about the, the filter bubble. And some years ago, there was Cass Sunstein who wrote in the, the Daily We about his fear that now that we can roll our own news, we're going to be paying more and more attention to sources that we agree with. And a lot of the social psychology research shows that groups of people who are more homogeneous in opinion tend to make more radical decisions. So I make it a, a I make sure that there is someone in my personal learning network whose blog I follow or who I follow on, on Twitter or otherwise pay attention to regularly. Someone who's intelligent and knowledgeable but with whom I disagree strongly about a number of things. So if nobody in your network annoys you, maybe you're in an echo chamber. So I think we're really talking about a, a combination of algorithmic, social, and cognitive tools we need to use. The, this is not rocket science. It's not even learning the multiplication tables. It's just that this has happened so fast, you're not taught how to search and how to crap detect in, in school before you do it. And because you brought up search, I just want to, one question I want this audience to think about is that, is it our responsibility not only to give people answers, but to teach them how to ask the right questions and how to verify those answers? So something to think about. And you, you brought up news and journalism, and we do all have these broadcasting tools in our pocket. So does that make us all journalists? Well, you know, one of the things I wrote in, in Smart Mobs was that it, it's not hard to predict that any day now there will be a world-changing news event that will be streamed or sent directly to the internet from someone's phone. And, and, and I think the, the first real worldwide one was the uh, July 2007 uh, two bombing in London. There was a very blurry picture from someone's phone that was sent yeah. there. So we now have hundreds of millions of reporters. And I would say that that's a great thing and that we now are able to crowdsource information that you wouldn't be able to get a reporter on site to before. I think that if you take reports and you look for ways to verify those reports, you find what are the different points of view about this report? Can I, can I find a spokesperson for the different points of view? Can I put that all together into a, a short, compelling narrative that, that people are going to want to pay attention to? That's what journalists have always done, whether they were working with pencils and paper or whether they're working with search engines and smartphones. And I think that the difference between a reporter and a journalist does have to do with that set of procedures that they do. Can more people do that kind of journalism? Uh, absolutely. I don't think that we want to classify being the ability, having the ability to take a picture or stream video as being a journalist. I think that it's, you're, you are reporting on something. Hmm. So there's, there is a theme throughout the book that a firm grasp of these literacies will allow you to multiply the value of a public good while also serving your own self-interest. And this is connected to what Tim O'Reilly calls the architectures of participation. So yeah, tell us more about that. I what does that mean? I was, I was struck by architectures of participation when I wrote Smart Mobs because we've always used communication media to do things together in new ways, whether that's writing or, or, or print um, or the telephone. The particular architecture of the internet allows us to do things that weren't really uh, possible before. I think, um, well, ah, you know, obviously um, Google is built both on attention and an architecture of participation. If uh, 
millions of people did not put links on their website, you, you wouldn't have PageRank. But essentially what, what PageRank is doing is it's, it's taking that human judgment, that, that attention that a, a blogger or anybody else who puts a link on the web page, they're saying, if you're paying attention to me, you should pay attention to this. And so add in the secret sauce of the, of the formula, that attention aggregated becomes a, a very valuable public good. I don't think people appreciate what a miracle free search is. And of course, it's not free. We're paying with our attention. And, and you make some very good money by selling that uh, attention to advertisers. And another great example was Napster. When Napster first came out, people didn't download music from a server. They downloaded music from other Napster users that had the music on their, on their PCs. By default, the folder that you download all your music to on Napster is open to everyone else who's on Napster at that moment for them to download. So this is a unique situation in which a population is able to provision a resource and the act of consuming it. And I think that that is new and it is afforded by the, the architecture of participation. Cory Doctorow calls this, in reference to the tragedy of the commons problem, sheep that shit grass. So I think that we're seeing a, a, a lot of different ways that people are able to use online platforms to coordinate all kinds of collective action and that architectures of participation taken together with our knowledge of how to use them is going to enable us to do things that are even more fantastic than what we're able to do now. So yeah, what are the different forms of participation? So participation, I, I, you know, there, there are a jillion ways to participate. I, I, I just noted a few examples um, to, to draw people's, people's attention to the importance of knowing how to participate. There was a Harry Potter website that was shut down by Warner Brothers a few years ago. And uh, Heather Lover organized a worldwide boycott of Warner Brothers and had the Warner Brothers lawyers back off their, their injunction before they found out that she was 16 years old. Um, Bev Harris was a pretty obscure blogger before she found the source code for the Diebold uh, voting machines online and circulated that. Some students at, at Swarthmore put it up on the Swarthmore server. They were sued by Diebold and federal court found that Americans do have the right to know how their voting machines work. She's an obscure blogger. She wasn't very obscure for very long. That climbed the, the, the power law curve to the, to the A-list bloggers very quickly. You, you all know who this is. And, and there's a, a, you know, a certain amount of controversy about the role of social media in the Middle East and North Africa and what's sometimes called Arab Spring. But, but there's no doubt that it played an essential role. So you're talking about people who start multi-billion dollar industries when they're 19 or 20 or 21 years old. I emphasize the youth of all of these people simply to emphasize that this new literacy the ability to know how to participate can lead to real economic and political and cultural power. We've got a huge number of ways to participate. And I love Ross Mayfield's uh, power law of participation in which he, he plots the threshold with the tool. How easy is, is it to do with the degree of engagement with the community? And you can start out by, if you are yet another reader of somebody's blog or another follower of them on Twitter, you're, you're, you're kind of adding to their installed attention base, but you can, you, can, you can plus things, you can like things, you can begin tagging and commenting, you can climb that curve, and by the time that you've climbed that, that curve, you are engaged in, in a, a lot of pretty sophisticated ways of participating online. One, I, I, I call one out here, um, I talk about in, um, in my talks, in the book I get into a lot of detail about the different ways of participation, but curation I think is a very easy, lightweight way for people to uh, participate in, in filtering the web for each other. Crap detection, of course, only eliminates the bad stuff. How do we um, float the good stuff up to the top? And so PageRank is one way to do it. But also, um, socially, we're, we're beginning to curate with each other. And I know that, that, that Google is, is, is getting with that idea as well. We've got all kinds of platforms that are popping up. Most people have heard of uh, Pinterest. But there's also you know, Scoop It. Uh, Pearl Trees, um, Storify, um, this seems like a natural for Google. It seems to me that curation is a fundamental literacy that is spreading through the population very quickly. 
So benefits, we all need to transform information overload into useful knowledge. We need to make those decisions about the utility of all the information that comes across. The uh, architecture of participation uh, means that there's no additional cost to make your decision, your private decision, public. And in open source uh, uh, programming, it's called scratching an itch. If a, a new printer is created and there's no driver for it, and you might as well write it yourself, you might as well al also contribute that to the public code base. Not only are you signaling that you are a person worth collaborating with, cooperating with, but you're recruiting a team so that when they change the hardware in that printer, you've got some people to help you change that. So self-interest that adds up to a public good. Yeah. Again, this is something that echoes a lot in the book. If you want to establish a reputation of knowing what you're talking about a subject, then every day tell people, I've looked at 100 different websites, and if you're interested in this particular niche, these are the five that you ought to pay attention to. If they are interested in that subject, they will know whether you know what you're talking about and they'll spread the word. And in fact, I think this is like personal search engine optimization. If you are curating topics that you feel you have some expertise on, people who are looking for information on that topic, people who are looking for experts are going to find you uh, that way. And so, and now of course we've got knowledge sharing as a form of per participation. You've got um, Stack Overflow, you've, you've got Quora. Um, I think we are only just beginning to see that the different ways that people can participate and Henry Jenkins calls the aggregation of a sufficient number of uh, knowledgeable participators participatory culture and makes the point that a, a, a person who sees herself as a, a passive consumer of culture has a different sense of agency as a citizen than someone who sees himself in ho however small a way as a producer of culture, whether it's just that they're tagging or, or commenting. And we've got a, a jillion different ways to participate in a new one coming up every day. So I think the proliferation of literacies about different ways of participating are enabling people to make their own way personally and professionally more effectively, but in the aggregate, they're adding up to things that are useful to all of us. So moving on to the next literacy, I want to know how have your thoughts about collaboration changed since and evolved since smart mobs? So, well, actually I've been thinking about this since 1987 when I wrote about virtual communities. Mm. It was very exciting to me that I could sit in my room, which I'd been doing with a typewriter for years, and communicate with the other people and share knowledge um, with other people. So. Uh, now the forms of collaboration, of, of collective action, of cooperation, and there's slightly different def definitions yeah. for, for each of those, are, are proliferating. I think this is probably the most powerful aspect of the cultural revolution we're going through now. Just as the invention of speech was extremely powerful cultural revolution, the invention of writing was an, an extremely powerful revolution. It was what the literate people did with those tools, they, they invented civilization and democracy and science. So I wrote about smart mobs 10 years ago. This picture was from Chile. When I went to Chile and talked about smart mobs there, they said, oh yes, the penguin revolution. Students in Chile wear black and white and gray uniforms, so they call them penguins. They objected to the very poor funding of public education in Chile by chaining the schools shut and hitting the streets with 700,000 other Chileans. They are still leading a, a very active um, dialogue about the role of uh, education in that country. And of course, we're seeing the Arab Spring, we're seeing Occupy Wall Street, all kinds of ways that people are able to organize collective action with people they weren't able to organize with before. And at speeds and at scales and in places they weren't able to organize before. And this is only beginning to play out. So, as I said, I wrote about virtual communities in 1987. It was pretty obscure then. In fact, it took me until 1992 to talk a publisher that, into um, backing a book on this. I was told only electrical engineers will want to use computers to communicate with. And so it's kind of hard in retrospect to see how odd it was to do that. But nowadays, whether you are a gamer or you are a cancer patient, 
you are probably connecting with people that you didn't know before and may never meet face to face, but who play a, a very important role in your life. Of course, now we've got distributed computation, started with SETI at home. I usually need to explain this to people, but don't need to explain yeah. it here. <laughs> Folding.stanford.edu, uh, people can, in fact, very recently fold it, the game based on uh, uh, folding it at home. Uh, has enabled a, a group of gamers to solve a uh, important puzzle about the way protease, the enzyme protease, very important in HIV research. There was a problem about how it folds that had not been solved before gamers did that using distributed computation. So we, we all know that in a few years, most of the human population will be walking around carrying or, or wearing supercomputers linked at speeds much greater than what we consider to be broadband today. So what kind of computation are we going to be able to do voluntarily? You know, when SETI at Home first started, they were, for some, at some point, the most powerful supercomputer in the world, 19 teraflops. And this was, gee, maybe uh, close to a decade ago. Now we've got crowdsourcing. Who here kn knew Jim Gray or, or, or knows the Jim Gray story? So um, I will just briefly repeat it. Jim Gray was a computer scientist at Microsoft Research working on distributed computation. And since um, he was working on that, he, he had a lot of friends in the industry. He took his sailboat out one day in San Francisco Bay a couple of years ago and did not return that evening. His friends got uh, the latest satellite photographs from NASA and from Google. And um, Microsoft engineers cut it up into half a million different images. And Amazon put it up on Mechanical Turk. They got a couple of thousand volunteers to search 3,500 square miles of ocean. They did not find Jim Gray. But what was particularly interesting to me about it was that people put this together with ad hoc tools within hours of Jim Gray being reported missing. So crowdsourcing is not just about a business getting its customers to do its work for them. It's about any, any way that you can cut a task up into a lot of uh, small pieces and somehow induce a population to uh, engage in it. And now we've got crowdfunding the, with this Jobs Act. The SEC has now made it legal for startups to take up to $2 million in Kickstarter type uh, funding. Um, now uh, we're hearing talk of collaborative consumption. There's a book about collaborative consumption. Probably a lot of you have used Airbnb. The ability to share your apartment, share your automobile, these are all things that people weren't able to do before because we weren't able to find out where's the nearest one and when's it available. So again, this architecture of participation, as it becomes more sophisticated, more location aware, more time aware, it enables people to build on those platforms more things that they can do together. And of course, collective intelligence. Wikipedia is not the end of this. Um, anytime that uh, people can put a small piece of the puzzle together and have that add up to something that makes sense to a lot of people, I think is, is really important. And now we're seeing um, with Udemy and Khan Academy and P2PU, there are actually dozens of these platforms for people to learn with each other. You know, you, we've never had the ability to, before to find out how to do things instantaneously. You can learn how to, to configure a Drupal installation or tie your shoes on YouTube. Uh, nowadays, people are using those things to learn cooperatively. I think we're really just at the beginning of that. Now, all of these involve a certain know-how, and people who have that know-how will be able to uh, summon these resources more effectively than people who don't. So jumping ahead to the last literacy, yeah. what does it mean to be a networked individual, and why are networks important? Well, you know, a lot of the terms about uh, network awareness and a lot of the little pieces of lore come from different disciplines. So there's people in, uh, in sociology and in, in network science. So network science is a new one. So we've learned about small worlds. We've learned about the power law. We've learned about the long tail. These all have applications um, in many different fields, in biology and in, in, in chemistry and in, in astrophysics. But the the, the lesson for everybody is that the structure of networks influences the kinds of behavior that can take place 
<laughs> in those networks. And the person who knows how a small world network works is going to be more effective online. Um, a lot of the, the ideas, like the presentation itself, Irving Goffman wrote about this decades before the internet existed. We all give information to others about who we want them to think we are. We all give off information to others about that they are able to detect about who they, they think we are. Um, a lot of these ideas uh, uh, about identity and individualism, net, net, networked individualism, um, moves from the kind of community-centric era of the virtual community, where you found people who were sharing a, their interest in a particular subject and then connected with the individuals. Now, of course, we carry our, our networks in our pocket. We're able to, to summon our social networks, and we're at the center of, of our social networks, and they're intersecting. There's a, a, a difference between a, a group, which so, sociologists say is, um, is densely knit. Most of the people in a group know each other and is tightly bound. There are very few connections with the outside world. And a network, which is um, uh, sparsely knit. Um, there are a lot of people in, in my network and in your network who don't know each other and, and is loosely bound. There are, are people from outside the network. In fact, that's how a small world network happens. A small number of connections in Italy. If I know someone in Italy, I can get information to them um, much, much faster, just, just that way. So a lot of these ideas that, that uh, sociologists have been looking at, social capital is a particularly useful one. Uh, the idea that people can get things done together outside the formal institutions of contracts or laws. How do they do that? Well, there's, there's bridging capital, there's, there's bonding capital, and there's reciprocity. One of the things I discovered looking at the sociology of reciprocity is that there's empirical research that shows that the, the probability that someone will offer you help online is most strongly predicted by whether you have offered help to others online. So I think, um, as I said, this is not rocket science or algebra, but if you learn about the way strong ties and weak ties are important to people, if you learn the way that social media and viral media are adding up to what um, Manuel Castells is calling a network society, he has said, with a lot of empirical backup, that it's not really accurate to say we're in an information society. We're in a network society, and we've always been involved in social networks, but the technical network networks that connect us today amplify that innate human sociality in ways that, that make all kinds of things that used to be impossible possible. Network publics and the connections between these, I think, make for someone who's got network know-how. So before we turn it over to Googlers, um, you know, these are the people who are building these tools. So I wanted to give you a chance to sort of, what are your parting questions for this, for this audience? What do you want these guys leaving with? So to what, to what degree are you in the know-how business? And, and how do you extend that? I remember that, that Microsoft had a really famous failure when they had the talking paper clip that, remember the talking paper clip was, is tremendously annoying. It's a hard problem. How do you, you've got a lot of data about how people behave and, 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 they're, and you don't want to freak them out about that either. So I think that there's some Googlers like hard problems. I think the hard problem is not just how do you improve search, how do you include more and more information in the information you're organizing, but how do you enable people to climb that power law of participation how, how do you enable them to learn to search, to learn more effectively? Um, one, you know, when I was looking at the, the uh, crap detection of medical information, the National Institutes of Health do have a browser add-on. So when you are browsing to websites that claim to have medical information, you can find out whether they approve or not. So I think, and I'm sure that you are thinking about this, there's some combination of crowdsourced social crap detection, social uh, verification, and algorithmic ways of determining it that, that we need to develop. The more bad information there is online, the more crucial that information is, the more effective we need to make the ways we evaluate that information as individuals. And we have a microphone, so I want to invite you guys to ask questions. I have a question related to the concept of the filter bubble. You mentioned that a strategy for avoiding that is seeking dissenting opinions or at least including some of those. 
I think there's a risk there that you end up with not being able to tell what the truth is because you just hear two different sides of a story. And in a lot of recent current events, there are definitely two completely opposing sides of the story, and it's almost impossible to know what the truth is. So my question is, uh, how, what are your thoughts about whether the filter bubble is sort of a human nature problem that people are going to uh, gravitate towards a position where they just vote based on wishful thinking? And what are some strategies that people can use to avoid that and get to actual truth as opposed to pleasing fiction? Well, the, the actual truth of the melting point of sodium is pretty easily determined. The actual truth of did this person commit a crime, um, we've developed this system where we have advocates f for both sides and we randomly select people to make a decision. So I think that there's really a continuum. The word truth, we, we pe tend to put a capital T on that and think that there is a truth. You know, so I, um, I, noted on, I, I noted this thing about uh, if there isn't someone in your, your network who uh, you regularly disagree with, who regularly annoys you, then you're, you're in an echo chamber. And someone else on Twitter said, nobody in their, their uh, network uh, disagreed about the uh, Trayvon Zimmerman uh, case. And I said, well, is nobody talking about the rights of the accused here? And the person immediately went off on an advocacy of arresting this person. Uh, but of course, the law is about um, protecting the rights of the most despised. So we develop these institutions to deal with some of the problems that have arisen from human uh, natural capacity to believe what they want to believe. Cognitive dissonance, there's a whole psychological study of how people will, and you can influence people's beliefs very, very easily by showing them information one way or the other. So uh, the, the truth is hard to find. I think just knowing that you can't accept all the information that comes across your, your screen at, uh, at, at face value is, is, is very significant. There's a difference there in terms of truth seeking. I think the scientific me method was a, a great advance in truth seeking. We can argue um, theologically and philosophically about things that can never be proven, but if we're arguing about the melting point of sodium, then let's just get that sodium out and, and a thermometer and, and find out. Hi. Um, one of the things that I find very disturbing at work is that we continue to use email in ways that seem inappropriate. I mean, I think it's great for, for, for uh, uh, a conversation, but we use it like to indicate status changes and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, but I can't think of an alternative that would work uh, as well uh, because email is so universal. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, alternatives to email that, that, that we should be working on. You know, I ranted about this for so long, so long ago that I actually stopped ranting about it. But, um, you know, there's some basic literacies. Uh, how about having an appropriate subject line? Or a subject line or, at all? Or a subject line that doesn't say about your email? Uh, people here are more sophisticated than that. But believe me, the, the, most of the people in the, in, the, in the enterprise world are not. How about not? Um, CCing um, everybody in the world. I did, I, I did it, there, there was something when I was doing consulting uh, for a, a company in Asia and someone sent out a message saying the Singapore office will be closed on Friday and I was in California and so I, I found out that how many people received that message. 17,000 people in the world had to know that the Singapore office was closed on Friday. And, uh, a, a lot of these things are best done with wikis and you know that and, 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 and Google Docs. Um, it's a matter of, of training people to use them. Actually, you gave me a couple ideas. Thank you. Cool. I think we are out of time, um, but thank you for coming, and you can buy books in the back. And I'll cool. sign them. <laughs>